John McKee's fate is now apparently in the hands of the Dallas County Grand Jury, at least temporarily. After meeting here in District Attorney Henry Wade's office this afternoon, Wade and Dallas Police Chief Frank Dyson issued a joint statement. The two men had apparently agreed not to talk to the Dallas-Fort Worth television audience, but the substance of their statement is that John McKee, chairman of the Dallas Crime Commission and one of the higher-ups in the Dallas Scottish Rite Temple, is not John McKee at all. He is, in fact, apparently James Kell Zollinger, who was once listed as a deserter from the United States Navy. The statement leaves no doubt that McKee and Zollinger are one and the same man. The information has been turned over to the Dallas County Grand Jury this morning, quote, for whatever action it wishes to take. However, Channel 8 News has learned from other sources that another separate investigation is underway right now on an entirely different matter, an investigation that may have more and farther reaching consequences than the announcement made today. This is Phil Reynolds, Channel 8 News on the Move in the Dallas County Courthouse. Well, we first uh, received a shooting call at 4703 Peach Street, and uh, our unit responded to the call, and when they arrived, they found the uh, victim's body inside the little chapel here at this location. Uh, upon the statement from a Mrs. Stegman, who stated that uh, to one of our officers that she drove the victim up here in the car, and she later stated that it happened at her residence, which is just outside of our quick limits, and that she was in the house and heard a popping noise outside, and she went out there and found the victim shot, and she drove him up here, and with the help of someone else, we don't know who, uh, they carried him inside. Was she dead when they got here? Uh, yes, sir. How many times have you been shot? Uh, three times, I believe once in the side and another one up under the left arm <clears throat> and another one in the left ear. Do you have a suspect in mind? Well, Miss Stegman stated that she thought it was her husband. What will develop from there, we don't know. It, due to the fact that it happened in the county, the county is investigating. The new post office for Dallas was announced back in 1967 with appropriate fanfare. Local and federal officials turned out in mass for the announcement and with good reason. The new post office was to be the answer to the postal problems in Dallas. It was to be built on a 40-acre tract in Oak Cliff at a cost of more than $26 million as the new headquarters for the Dallas post office. On that day back in 1967, Officials said the postal facilities in Dallas were among the most deplorable in the country for crowded conditions, but the new post office to change all that was said to be a top priority of the LBJ administration. Construction would then go forward to completion within two to three years thereafter. We cannot pin it down any closer at this time because we haven't employed our architect yet and we'll be moving to, in that direction very quickly. Kaufman's statement was made nearly five years ago. But since then, the site for the new post office here in Oak Cliff has changed little. Not one shovel full of dirt has been turned. In fact, sources in Washington tell Channel 8 News that there currently are no plans to build a new post office in Dallas. The sources also indicate that the money appropriated by Congress is no longer earmarked for such a facility. Those plans apparently became the victim of the transition from the old post office department to the new postal service a reorganization which went into effect in May of last year. The loss of the facility to be built on the site in Oak Cliff certainly has, uh, has caused some problems in Dallas, but it has not uh, deteriorated the service to the people in Dallas. It's made it necessary that the management of the Dallas Post Office make internal changes, such as getting additional space and 
making these changes in order to keep this service up. We now operate out of four buildings, and uh, we're still maintaining the service that uh, our customers here in Dallas are, have been enjoying over the years. I do not agree with Mr. Frederick's statement that the loss of the new facility will not have an effect on the service of the mail to the people of Dallas. I think it has in the past, and I'm sure it will in the future, have an effect of the, on the service to the people that they will not have as good a service as they would have had if we had the new facility. But despite this disagreement over what effect loss of the new post office will have on postal service in Dallas, one thing is certain. The transition from the old post office department to the new U.S. Postal Service will provide another facility. Sources in Washington have revealed to Channel 8 News that the Dallas-Fort Worth area has been selected as the location for a new bulk mail plant, one of 21 such facilities to be located across the country as the basis of a new bulk mail network. The location for the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the bulk mail facility has not yet been selected, but sources say it will cost $39 million and should be completed by late 1975. And so it appears that the Dallas-Fort Worth area has gained one new postal facility at the expense of another. Jack Hill, Channel 8 News on the move. Coach, uh, what are you going to do this time that you didn't do down at College Station? Well, I hope, Jerry, the thing that we can do is score at least one more point than Texas A&M. Uh, and this will be most difficult for us. They have a fine basketball team. They lost a tough game to Texas in Austin uh, last Tuesday night. Uh, I'm sure that they'll be up and ready for the ball game. Uh, I just hope that we'll be ready. With the Aggies being a taller team, do you think you'll be able to manipulate better from the outside than you did, say, against some of the other ones? Well, uh, Texas A&M is a very physical ball club. They're big and strong, and this was one of the problems we had in College Station. Uh, they really gave us a lesson on both boards and rebounding, and uh, we have got to stay on the boards with them if we expect to win the ball game. Well, so far we are 6-1 and one in dual meets, and uh, we really haven't tapered down for any big meets yet, but uh, this meet coming up this weekend, the Southwestern AEUs and the Tennessee meet, we're going to be uh, tapering down a little bit to try to get some fast times because they're going to be some really tough competition. Do you feel this will be a sort of a prelude to the conference meet, this AAU meet? Yes, as a matter of fact, I believe that possibly some of the times will be faster here than the conference meet because our pool is so much faster than theirs especially in the distance events where they have an altitude factor there and uh, the times will probably be faster here. How about your personal program? Are you at your goal at this stage of the year? Well, uh, all of us set uh, goal times throughout the year with a coach at the first of the year and so far I'm a little bit ahead of what I was supposed to be right now so I'm pretty pleased with it. How many events would you swim in this weekend? Uh, six altogether. No, seven four individuals and three relays. We are suggesting uh, presidential preference caucusing all the way through the procedure rather than just at the precinct level. We're also suggesting a new form of voting called cumulative voting which was used in the Arizona uh, precinct caucuses just recently. Uh, this ensures that minority groups and minority viewpoints will be represented, you know, without having to set quotas, which is a very difficult thing to do.
theater is a reflection of society, a mirror of social upheaval and changing times. Well, this Chicano group is no exception. These students from Jacinto Trevino College are acting out what they know best, Chicano problems. These skits mark the beginning of the first Chicano symposium here at SMU, a day devoted to exploring the issues facing Chicanos. The main speaker is the Reverend Henry Costo, an activist priest. There's a growing awareness in Dallas uh, to the issues and to the problems. I still think that, there has a, that we have a long way to go in the bringing in of personnel, or the retraining of personnel to address themselves in whatever service available in really building a viable community so that your triathlete community can live in harmony together. You know, they say that uh, the real test of, of a minority strength is its political force. Do you think that Chicanos are going to have a, a significant voice in the upcoming elections? Well, I think the political reality is that the, the Chicano controls about 164 uh, electoral votes in the, in the Southwest, including Chicago. And uh, the community has become a little bit more politically astute to this realization. What about in Texas? Do you think a Chicano could get elected to state office? We've had some excellent candidates. Uh, uh, we've had some appointed. Uh, we've had men like Congressman Henry D. Gonzalez run for governor, and we know that, what happened there. I think we have to run more and more candidates. I don't think that, for example, in San Antonio, even my own home, where they try to run a mayor, a, a Mexican-American mayor, San Antonio of all places, that couldn't take place. I don't think Texas is, is willing at this time to accept that. This Chicano Symposium obviously can't solve the problem facing Mexican-Americans, but it is putting the focus on increasingly vocal minorities. Martha McIntyre, Channel 8 News, on the move. Dallas was the, the only uh, member of the OEO project that did not have a single negative comparison. In other words, in every case, the, the kids who were in the OEO program here did as well or better than did those in the control group. Are programs of this type continuing here in Dallas? Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the, the math programs uh, that was at Thompson Elementary School under OEO is, uh, uh, is being turnkeyed at Dunbar uh, right now. And uh, by being turnkeyed, I mean we are actually uh, running the program instead of a contractor running it, we the school district. Do you feel that the indi individualized instruction is the coming thing in school systems? Well, we all learn as individuals, and I certainly think that uh, to, since everybody learns in, in different rates and different ways, that uh, the better we can individualize the program, the, the uh, better we're succeeding in, our, in what we're trying to do in the public school. To it treat all students as if they were the same is just incorrect. That's, that's an incorrect assumption. Is it easier for students to learn? Uh, do they learn quicker? Yes, because uh, uh, in an individualized program, if it's run correctly, uh, uh, no student is left. And yet no student has to wait for the teacher to get out of the way before he can progress as fast as possible.
Carefully cultivated sources at Carswell Air Force Base and higher in the Department of Defense seem embarrassed that they can't comment on the current deployment of bombers. But it's kind of a game that has to be played according to the rules. Both newsmen and military types realize that. Other participants are not quite so happy. Dependents of the vanished men know what the destination of their fathers and husbands is, but they are sort of honorary players in the game. They can't really appear to be upset by the move. Edith Collins is philosophic about the whole thing. Well, I guess I could be if I would let it, but this is something that is required by his job, and there are all types of drawbacks in any profession you have. This is just one that is involved with being in the Air Force. Some of the other wives are not so stoic about the Guam affair, but in the final analysis, they pretty well understand it. Jay Lewis, Channel 8 News on the Move. I think that uh, we are obviously very concerned in Europe, should there be a withdrawal of American troops from Europe, but at the same time, there is absolutely no doubt about it that uh, the United States has put in an enormous amount of money and men into the alliance, and that we, the Europeans, have got to stand more firmly on our own feet. And uh, there's been a, a big drive in the last two years to try and get the European members of the community to put more into defense uh, and therefore, you know, absolve you from some of uh, the responsibilities which you have so nobly borne. Well, it came as a surprise, for one thing, because uh, I don't score too many goals. But uh, I think one of the Tulsa players uh, uh, had a stoppage of play right in front of their net. So there's a face-off in front of their net. And uh, I stand right behind the, the center uh, for a face-off. And uh, J.P. LeBlanc, he motioned to me that he was going to bring the draw back. So he did, and, and came right to my stick, and I shot it. And there must have been four or five people in front of the uh, goaltender, because he was screened, and, and the puck didn't hit anybody. He just caught the mesh in the, in the net. So. I was pretty happy, and all that occurred in about a minute, so. Would you have to say this was your most uh, spectacular, let's put it like that, goal that you've scored this year? I don't know, it was really a thrill. I've never scored against uh, Tulsa. Of course, I haven't scored too many goals against anybody. But uh, it was a big game, and, and uh, scoring early like that, uh, it's got to you know, take the starch out of some of the players, and it gives you a big lift to be a, a goal ahead in, in you know, such a short time. How many goals and assists also have you scored this year? I have five goals and 22 assists. It's my best year so far, <laughs> let's put it that way. I got 19 points last year, uh, three of which were goals, so I'm a little bit ahead of the pace from last year. 